Hello, everyone. Let's get started. On behalf of Haynes & Boone, Aegis Energy Risk, and Entercom, I'd like to welcome you to Season 1, Episode 5 of the Weekly Energy Tracker. My name is Jeff Nichols. I'm a partner in the Houston office of Haynes & Boone and co-chair of the Energy Practice Group. I'll be the moderator of today's call. This series is scheduled for 30 minutes at this time on Tuesday mornings at 9 a.m. Central through May 12th. After May 12th, we may continue the series or change the format. This is being broadcast by WebEx. If you're joining by audio only, you won't be able to see the slides that are shown on the WebEx link if you join uh, via your computer. This call is being recorded and will be available for replay by Entercom at oilandgas360.com and by Hans and Boone on our podcast called On Track. If you're listening to a replay of this and would like to know the dial-in for the live calls, feel free to email me at jeff.nichols at hainesboone.com. This call will be brief and your lines have been muted. We will not open the line for discussion. You are, however, welcome to email me with questions, comments, queries at uh, my, the email address I just gave, jeff.nichols at hainesboone.com. The speakers for today are shown on the next slide. Uh, Matt Marshall from Aegis will provide some insights on pricing, including mm -hmm. negative pricing, and markets and hedging. <clears throat> Aaron Vanderford from Entercom will touch on some business issues and will explain a new finance term called EBITDAC. As usual, we have Craig Grauman from Haynes & Boone and Kelly Norfleet from Haynes & Boone, partners in our energy finance and bankruptcy sections. And we had also lined up James Marcus, Jim Marcus, a finance partner in our Dallas office to talk about the Paycheck Protection Act. However, we reshuffled the speakers at the last minute because of the events of yesterday and the negative trading. So we invited Phil Lukadu, who's co-chair of our Commodities Trading Practice Group and who regularly advises some of the largest energy traders in the energy sector to discuss this concept of negative pricing. Then we'll uh, have an open discussion of the panel um, also joined by Buddy Clark, who I didn't mention earlier, who's uh, also the co-chair of uh, the Energy Practice Group at Haynes & Boone. And finally, if there's time, Buddy Clark will explain what the potato king from Idaho has to do with today's oil trading markets and the reason prices went negative yesterday. So first, we'll turn over to Matt Marshall. Thanks, Jeff. I had a little trouble with my mute button there. Well. We are a privileged group. We got to see something that's never been observed, and that is negative pricing at WTI, and not just negative, but negative 37. So uh, I don't like it very much. I don't know about you. Um, it's an interesting thing to see. Uh, some notes about what happened yesterday. Let's go ahead and go to the first, to the slide that shows the prices. Um, this shows a few things. It shows yesterday's settle for futures prices uh, there in the one that goes negative 37, but I showed uh, two other things. I just want to give some context here and some good news actually to start out with. Um, this is yesterday's settles, by the way. It's not current. It's not as, as of this morning. I figured if I put in morning prices today, they might be out of date in 10 minutes, and so this is what happened yesterday. But I also show the forward curve from a week ago and from a month ago, and so here's the good news is that despite having this just this absolutely awful May uh, WTI futures contract right now. Uh, the the rest of the forward curve is actually for a big part of that is actually higher than it was a month ago, and so you still have the opportunity to. And I understand that twenty dollar prices is not something that's attractive attractive to the most producers, but you still have the opportunity to take some of that risk off the table and hedge into a forward curve that's actually risen recently. So there's some good news there. All right, the other thing I wanna point out is that that minus $37, that's the May contract for the WTI futures. Producers are not typically getting that $37 for May. Uh, in fact, they, most producers use a calendar month average pricing scheme, and you're currently pricing April barrels, not May barrels. And the way this works is right now, the active future contract is for May delivery. And um, let's talk about what that futures contract is. That futures contract is the an agreement, it's a standardized agreement that you can you can trade just on an exchange. And it is the if you if you sell that contract, you are obligating yourself to deliver deliver barrels into specific terminals in Cushing, Oklahoma, during the month of May. And if you are uh, buying that contract, you're agreeing to take delivery of those barrels during the month of May. But the way that most producers get paid is they get a calendar month average. So the current active futures contract is May. Tomorrow, today, May will expire. And tomorrow, uh, the June WTI futures contract will be the active contract. 
And what producers typically get is the calendar uh, calendar month average, which is the daily average of whatever the active future contract is. So uh, yesterday's settle of minus $37 is just 121st of the uh, the formula for April pricing. So that's just something to point out there is that uh, it wasn't a meet, like you're not uh, setting up for a, a month of minus $37 or $0 next month. So let's also talk about what happened yesterday real brief, briefly. Uh, when I mentioned that the futures contract is when you buy a futures contract, you agree to take delivery of a barrel. And I think that's the uh, that's that's a big source of why, why prices went down so fast. What you likely had was holders of futures. Uh, so they were obligated to take physical de delivery, trying to get out of that obligation. Um, the other thing I'd point out is that it was very it was pretty thin trading for May. Uh, only about seven to eight percent of total volume traded yesterday was for the May contract, and so what you saw was a, a free fall where sellers overwhelmed buyers. Probably some traders forced to sell either because the prices were heading down; they were told to get out. Maybe some uh, you know, margining effects, um, but maybe some panic, all of that. But the thing that we should take away from this is what might yesterday's trading tell us about the future, and it is possible that yesterday, as these people had studied the uh, the amount of barrels they were gonna be forced to take in May, and they decided that I might not have storage available to take delivery of this and, and you know, physically be able to handle these barrels. And if so, then I need to sell at whatever price I can to get out of my obligation. And the point to, to read into this is that, is it possible that as we get into the June contract that you'll face those same kind of constraints and you might have people willing to sell out of those obligations again. And I think it is possible and it's worth taking a look at the rest of, uh, you know, rest of the summer, especially to see if it's worth hedging. Uh, one final note here is I didn't update regional pricing. I know a lot of people on this call are very interested in what and how like, yesterday's uh, price action and today's price action are gonna affect like Midland or Houston or other where. If anyone's interested, I'll post a regional pricing article on our site. Just send me a note to view at aegis-energy.com and uh, I'll post it there and give you a link to it. So uh, that's for me. I'll turn it over to Aaron. Hey, Matt, thank you. Uh, certainly negative pricing is, is one of those things that the market is, is very much focused on. Uh, earnings season started last week and I thought I'd take a quick look at, at earnings and then really work to, to identify the real question of when does production really roll over this time? And I think that plays into uh, maybe a little bit more of the timing and do we see this again for the June contract and, and what does that look like? And so in the first slide, I uh, certainly saw on social media a, a mug and, and this EBITDAC idea. Um, I think that's something that, you know, earnings this quarter are going to be before coronavirus. And as, as one client asked me, do I really have to do an earnings call this, this quarter? Uh, the answer is yes. And we're, we're working through that with all of our clients. And, and it's less about the earnings this time and really more about what is it that the market needs to see and activity levels. And so companies are going to be demonstrating their capital discipline, acting proactively and highlighting uh, optionality as the key to making it through this earn earnings call. The Schlumberger and Halliburton have already led the group uh, for the oil field service group. A couple interesting points that came out of those calls that'll that'll speak to activity levels. Uh, Schlumberger put out there that they believe frack spreads uh, and the count will, will kind of trough around 100. Uh, there's been some other speculation that this is probably going to be closer to 50 or 60. So I think, you know, I'll, I'll show on my next slide that, that we're going to get probably less activity uh, from here. But international is certainly a bright spot over U.S. on shore. Uh, even the big guys are work, working to right size their balance sheets. Uh, Schlumberger cut their dividend by 75%, and Halliburton uh, reduced their debt by 500 million and extended uh, some runway. Uh, pricing on oil field service is already low, and so a lot of the EMP clients are asking uh, for 25% cuts like they did in 2016. Uh, that's probably not going to happen as we went from $50 oil to now negative. Uh, and again, EMP operators generally aren't getting that negative price as Matt talked about. Uh, but certainly there's there's CapEx cuts hap happening on the oil field service side. And what that means is oil field service companies are gonna be looking to idled equipment 
to replace that broken equipment uh, rather than doing maintenance. And so there's an asset base that, that may not be getting fully maintained. And so we use all of these points to really answer the question, I think this quarter on calls, when does production really roll over? And so if I look at 2014 and the Thanksgiving Day surprise here, we had nearly 1,600 rigs working. It took five months. Uh, we saw the, the peak in April of 2015 for production to roll over. Rig counts declined by 56% over that time to 703 rigs, oil rigs. So from that standpoint, it took another year and a half for us to work through the process and, and get to a, a stabilization. And we that downturn was all about efficiencies. And so we started that production inflection point with 425 low rigs working. So if I take that and I look at where we are today, we've certainly seen a, a very sharp percentage decline in oil rigs uh, so far. That decline really started in March uh, with 683 rigs. And so that's very similar to what we were seeing at year end. So if I imply that that's probably some moderate growth at that point, we're down as of last week, and I won't say today, certainly as of last week, I think we've lost more rigs uh, by today. You know, we're down to 438 rigs. That's still above the inflection point that we saw in September of 2016, certainly a higher base today. And so there will be more cuts. I would expect to see rig count if we if we think that 56% decline rate is uh, where we kind of need to get to. That gets us down to 300 rigs. And we're on track to probably see that uh, early part of May. The wild card for this cycle, I think, is shut-ins, and certainly the shut-ins will will flatten the curve, and and I think that gives some people maybe some confidence here, uh, particularly as as Brent pricing falls below 20 this morning, that maybe OPEC will will move up some of their cuts. Uh, but people much smarter than myself can get provide a real timeline when production rolls over. But I think it's important to look at the history, and so that. I'll turn it back over to, to uh, Jeff. We can continue a little bit more discussion on the uh, negative pricing. Thanks, Aaron. Um, so the negative pricing sounds like from, from Matt's discussion, uh, when it comes to what oil companies actually get for their barrels of oil, uh, it won't necessarily be negative $38, but the, uh, the negative uh, price does uh, presage or kind of foretell a, a problem that we've been discussing in these calls for some time, which is storage filling up and more oil being produced than can be consumed. So if uh, if that is, in fact, what's going to come down the pike, I thought I'd explore some of the legal and business issues um, arising if that were the, the situation. So, uh, but first I wanted to talk to Phil. Phil, you represent a lot of the biggest traders in this space, um, physical and financial. And the financial trading is is obvious. It's up there on the screen, and it's it's horrible. But the physical trading is what I'm curious about. If storage fills up, um, what are some of the legal issues we can uh, expect to come down the pike on these physical contracts? Well, I think the the, the physical contracts will probably have uh, the same kind of questions we've been answering or uh, being asked. Uh, on construction contracts and so many others, which is, you know, can I declare a force majeure event? Uh, if I cannot, because of the way my contract is worded, uh, can I claim frustration of purpose? Can I claim impossibility of performance? Are there other things I can do? Uh, if there's a government action or an order about, you know, stay at home, can I claim that that's what caused my force majeure? Can I be creative? What can I do with my contract? So I think a lot of folks are going to be looking at their contracts and saying, what can I do? Um, and, and of course, force majeure definitions tend to vary across the lot. Uh, I think the critical thing about what we learned from yesterday, uh, as, as Matt said, you know, the, the market was pretty thin in terms of liquidity. <clears throat> and so we don't know necessarily whether, um, you know, the folks that happened to hold on to those futures contracts too long were maybe inexperienced and not really aware of what they had uh, or the, of the physical delivery obligation. And so there's a lot of, there's a lot of interesting uh, data that we just don't have right now to know necessarily what, you know, led to the, the decline, but it doesn't take much 
when someone realizes, wow, I've, I've got to get rid of this contract because I can't take it. I don't have storage lined up and, and I've got to do something quickly. And then the price just collapses really fast. Um, I, I don't know necessarily in terms of, um, in terms of you know, where this may go uh, for future months, but I think it's something that people may think of as we get closer to the end of next month, presuming that, uh, that uh, there's the possibility that you know, the economies have not turned back on and we're not seeing people driving their cars and, and consuming gasoline again. And uh, Buddy, Craig, and Kelly, I know you're you're working on a lot of restructurings right now, and and in and out of bankruptcy. Um, I recognize uh, uh, what Matt said that the um, the price yesterday is only one twenty first of the uh, average pricing that oil companies will get, but it is still a, a financial price that people use to hedge and rely on to to get a financing done or to even get a three sixty three sale done. Um, I wonder if you have any observations, um, and would include Matt in that, on uh, what this means for oil companies trying to, to get a deal done in this market. I guess, Matt, you want to talk about hedging first and then maybe go to Kelly? Sure. You know, I would say that um, the, the the hedging that is done is still done on a calendar Average is just there's a separate curve for a calendar month average curve, and it, it looks a lot like the the NYMEX futures curve, especially as you get a little you know, farther down the road and the curve starts to flatten out. Um, I, I'd also say that uh, at you know the the rest of 2020 being in around 23 dollars or something like that is, uh, in my opinion, and just the experience dealing with my clients, it's not a number that encourages a lot of growth. And so what we would expect is that uh, you would see a little less hedging activity um, in, the, in the next several months because there's an expectation that there would be fewer barrels produced at later this year or into 21. Uh, so you, see, you might see less uh, activity from producers hedging in the back of the curve because they just don't have as much as they need to hedge. Um, and that, that probably includes uh, acquisitions too. I would say among our clients who are acquisitive, they, uh, the the amount of deal flow is slowing down and people are just taking time and it's uh, taking a little bit more uh, you know, pre-work to be able to get some deals done. So uh, from that point of view, I'd say there's uh, you know, less hedging going on too. But the big big news here is still, uh, you can still get ahead of any, if, you have, if you're in a situation where financials just will not allow your price to go down any further from here, there is still time to protect yourself from that. And, and Kelly, uh, do you have any observations from the bankruptcy side of things? We've seen several sale processes that haven't worked out or had to be renegotiated. And um, I've always wondered why they don't hedge more in, in bankruptcy uh, to try to get these deals done. Um, but I was wondering if you had any observation about what these, these uh, prices mean for the, the cases you're working on. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Um, I, I think in short, the, the current volatility uh, in, in the prices really makes restructurings a lot more difficult. Um, and, you know, as you mentioned, with 363 sales, we have seen some cases, um, some sales fall apart even before uh, prices have slid as low as they have in the last 24 hours. Um, I, I think uh, the declining prices and the volatility just makes it more difficult for buyers, for lenders, for debtors. Uh, to really get a line of sight on what the value of the assets is, which makes it a lot harder to know um, what you're what you what you're buying and what that's going to be worth going forward, uh, as well as if you're a if you're a creditor, you know what what the assets are. If you're a secured creditor in particular, what your collateral is worth uh, and how you can try to um, restructure around that value. It, you know, given everything that's been going on with the COVID-19 pandemic, um, it's difficult to know when demand is going to bounce back. And so, um, you know, while the, while the price um, slide yesterday um, focused on made deliveries, um, it's unclear whether there's going to be, um, continue to be difficulty obtaining storage, uh, which might lead to uh, further shut-in of wells, which, you know, then if, if, you're, if you're a producer and you're, um, if your revenue stream is totally cut off, where do you go from there? How do you reorganize that? And so you might see more uh, standstill agreements in the future where, where parties agree to 
just sort of put things on ice um, for a period of time to see if prices rebound. Gotcha. And buddy, um, I was wondering if you could give us kind of the historic perspective. You you wrote about the '80s in your uh, in your book, and um, and part of your book talks about the the trading system and how that affects oil companies. I was wondering if you could put this in uh, a bigger picture perspective for us. I don't know if it's exactly a bigger picture, but historically, uh, you know, yesterday was a very historic day for the for trading of futures in, on oil. But it was actually similar history that created the uh, NYMEX to start trading oil back in the late 70s. Uh, the Potato King of Idaho, J.R. Simplot, wanted wanted the exchange, which was basically just exchanging main potatoes because it was a smaller market they could manipulate it. Uh, he wanted the the NYMEX start trading Idaho potatoes. They wouldn't do it, so he went short on a bunch of contracts. The other traders found out it was Simplot on the other side of the contracts, and so they tried to stuff him. Uh, and he he didn't uh, he didn't buy out of those contracts at the last minute, and then defaulted on them. And when he defaulted on contracts, that was historically never had been done before in exchange. And uh, the CFTC got involved and told. The NYMEX, they couldn't they couldn't trade in potatoes anymore because they didn't have control over their markets. Uh, and when the NYMEX couldn't trade potatoes, that was 80% of their income. They had to find something else to trade, so they looked around and they had previously had some contracts for trading oil uh, on the Rotterdam market. So they took those contracts and started trading oil back in 1978 or so. So uh, uh, somewhat ironic that. The trading for oil today is an outgrowth of the NYMEX inability to uh, control the main potato and Idaho potato wars of the 1970s. Yeah, and, and Matt and Phil, I mean, it, we, we hear about, we read about these ETFs that roll over contracts every month. Um, I'm not going to compare them to the potato king of 1976, but um, to what degree are these ETFs really just swinging the price uh, as they just get in and out of the market? Or do you have a feel for that at all? Yeah, this is a, this is a really good question. So the, the ETFs, exchange traded funds, and what they do is they, they set up a, a vehicle that you can buy and sell during the day on an exchange. It's supposed to mimic the price of oil uh, in this case, since we're looking at a, an oil ETF. And uh, what they do is they try to mimic the price of the front contract. And so what that means is they constantly have to own the front contract. So when one expires, they like May is expiring today, at some point during the month, they needed to sell out of that and then buy the, the next contract, which would be the June contract. And so because the, the USO, for example, is so big, uh, whenever they start doing those roll mechanisms, selling the front month and buying the next month, uh, it can move price around. Now, I think, I'd have to go check, but I think that their roll period was already done before yesterday. Um, but uh, that doesn't mean that they didn't take out a lot of the contracts that would have been traded yesterday if they hadn't been there to uh, to do their role. Um, the other thing I'd point out about that is if anybody is looking out there and say, oh, wow, look at the value of USO, I should go ahead and buy it. Uh, remember what they do. They they Right now, the, the forward curve is upward sloping, like I showed. They're constantly selling the front, which is cheap, and they're buying the next contract, which is more expensive. So they're buying they're selling low and buying high that's usually not good in trading uh, and we call that a negative roll yield and so watch out if you want to invest in the, that etf as a vehicle for giving getting exposure to oil gotcha. uh, Craig, yeah, yeah. yeah one of the things that we gotta one of the things we sorry but one of the things we got to be thinking about too is is what does this mean if anything to uh, some of the bailout funds that that are yet to be negotiated, and uh, and how those standards will be applied, <clears throat> and and there's discussion like in the Financial Times uh, from from yesterday that was talking about um, you know whether bailing out E and P companies in the oil industry is a smart thing. If it's a company that's already troubled, shouldn't they be allowed to go to bankruptcy? And and then a healthier company would buy their assets. And is that better than financing zombies and propping up a company that doesn't need to be propped up? I think that kind of issue is probably going to be discussed a bit. And and so some of the some of the standards that have not yet been set, just some of the 
the mid-sized businesses and, and the larger bailouts as part, or not bailout, but funding as part of the CARES Act uh, may have some something to do with those kind of questions. That's a good point, Phil. Um, one question I get a lot is, is what are oil companies doing right now? Um, and sometimes there's some confusion between plugging and abandonment and um, uh, shutting in wells. And if the price of oil is just kind of below the cash cost, exactly how would they do that? Um, uh, Aaron, I, I wonder if you have any, um, you were talking about the decline in production. I mean, what are companies uh, looking at right now in that respect? Yeah, so certainly we've seen a march down in, in every couple of weeks. You know, some companies are on their third iteration of capital uh, budget cuts. And we've come into now a point where we're we're shutting in wells and they're generally what we've been hearing is they're they're less productive wells, uh, they're lower tier uh, economic wells getting shut in. Uh, these can be turned back on and take some service uh, to potentially do that. It'll vary basin by basin. Uh, but there may be a point that the longer that they're shut in, uh, we may not see some of those those marginal wells or those stripper wells uh, actually come back and and may get moved into a plugged and abandoned. But uh, currently, it's really just a an idea of of shutting in. Uh, we saw some some market news of of Cox Energy, which was Energy Twenty One, shutting in some of their wells in the Gulf of Mexico, and so those are are more near term uh, shut ins. And buddy, could you explain the difference between shutting in a well and plugging a well and just briefly the held by production issue of losing leases? Well, shut in is just a, a temporary cessation of production. Plugging abandonment is uh, what it sounds like. You're, you're, you're abandoning that well and uh, not likely to reenter it at any time uh, in the near future, if at all. Uh, the reason why that's important is a lot of oil and gas leases have, are contracts that provide the oil company can hold on to the lease for so long as it continues to produce in commercially reasonable quantities. And that's a test that's measured on a state-by-state -state basis, but essentially temporary shut-ins is certainly for uh, equipment improvements or workovers would not terminate a lease. If you shut in a well for a long period of time in the hope and speculation that prices are going to come back two to three years from now, courts are going to be less likely to view that favorably from the from the lessee or the oil company's perspective. And if a, a landowner, the mineral owner, wants to uh, call the lease terminated, the courts may be more inclined to do so. Courts uh, are, are reluctant to cause forfeiture of real property interest, so there's that that inherit bias in the court system uh, in favor, if you will, of producers, but that's a bias that could certainly be overcome if you shut in a well for too long. Uh, and Jeff, just one thing, I think we talked last week about the Railroad Commission's meeting on whether or not to issue proration orders. They are meeting, the Railroad Commission again meets today, uh, and I don't know exactly what, their, what the outcome is gonna be, but people should be watching to see if there's anything there as well as the Oklahoma Corporate Commission is talking about a similar hearing next month. Uh, I think the market will overtake any regulatory actions from what Aaron's talking about. Companies uh, are already laying down rigs and, and probably shutting in wells for some period of time, or if not shutting them in, probably uh, doing some self-proration by producing maybe a week per month on well-by-well -well rolling basis. Okay, and we're coming up on 9.30, so Jim uh, would like to invite you back next week to talk about the uh, bailout programs here. But I was wondering if you could just give us just a quick overview of, of what these programs are and what you'll be able to, to talk about next week. Uh, sure. Uh, I mean, it's hard to believe that it's been uh, only three weeks since the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act was enacted uh, since there's been so much activity. But the activity has been focused on the Paycheck Protection Program, which is really for small businesses, employers with less than 500 employees. Uh, the, act yeah. also, the Act also called for a mid-sized business loan program, um, but there's been no 
uh, regulations or uh, other guidance from the Treasury Department on that. Um, the Fed did come up with some term sheets that they proposed for a Main Street business lending program that would assist businesses with more than uh, 500 uh, employees, uh, but uh, nothing's uh, uh, happened on that either. So uh, we're, we're in a situation where uh, we're, we're waiting to see how, how things develop with these mid-sized business loan programs. Gotcha. Well done. Um, we're out of time and we're trying to keep these calls um, succinct as possible and, and to the time limit. So sorry to have to cut things off, but we'll invite everybody back a week from today, um, next Tuesday morning at 9 a.m. And we'll invite Jim back to expand a little bit about these um, programs. Uh, thanks everyone for attending and uh, keep an eye out if you're interested for a podcast or the replay on oilandgas360.com. <laughs>